Good morning, it's me, Kenny Fulker, and I'm coming to you once again live from Cape Cod. See right through there, the sky is blue, and right in there is a way out through Woods Hole and out to Martha's Vineyard, which would be straight across. That's over here, this tip over here is Marion, Massachusetts, and the other side uh, would take you right out to the Cape Cod Canal, which takes you through and out to the other side of the Cape into the Great South Bay and Plymouth and uh, up to Boston. In any event, it is another gorgeous day here. As you can see, it's about 75 degrees right now, probably going up to about 80, and it's gonna be clear skies and absolutely gorgeous. So what is it that you need to know? Uh, today to get you started. Well, the earnings continue to impress and stocks continue to advance. Microsoft and Google reported after the bell last night, both beat, but traders sold Microsoft as they bought Google. And today it's Fed Day. We're going to expect a 25 basis point hike, but then talk of more hikes to come. And that is possibly the surprise. And what do we have for dinner tonight? We're having the roasted chicken parts with sweet sausage and sweet vinegar peppers. Oh my God, and roasted potatoes. It's so good. Okay, so look, again, the markets closed higher yesterday. The Dow gaining 28 points. The S&P was up 12. The NASDAQ was ahead by 85. The Russell arose one point, while the transport struggled to, uh, uh, to do anything, but they ended up losing about 17 points. Nothing dramatic. The day got off to a rousing start. 22 of the 25 names that reported yesterday morning all beat. They beat on the top line. They beat on the bottom line. They beat everywhere you could look, and they all offered up exciting and robust guidance, and investors loved it. It was three. GE, Dow, Polaris, Pulte Homes, and General Motors, etc. In fact, CEO Mary Barra of General Motors was so excited to announce her blowout numbers and the strong guidance in the coming months, she couldn't even contain herself. Now, I just can't wait until the UAW does uh, to sit down with her to negotiate their contract. What they're going to do to her, and that begins on Tuesday, right? The contract for the UAW workers expires on September 14th with all of them. In fact, the UAW has already made it very clear they are prepared to strike. Need we say any more? In fact, Sean Fain, who is a UAW president and far more confrontational than any prior leadership, could not be any clearer, saying, and I quote, if the big three don't give us our fair share, then they are choosing to strike themselves, and we're not afraid to take action. Uh, that about says it all. Jim's forward guidance, by the way, is contingent upon General Motors successfully managing this process. So if negotiations with United Airlines and American Airlines or with UPS are any indication, then prepare yourself for some more fireworks. In any event, the focus on the union negotiations is directly tied to the outstanding earnings numbers that they're all reporting. And the front of the line now wants what the back of the line takes home every day. Better pay, better benefits, better options, and more stock awards, right? But investors were paying it very close to the vest in the morning uh, as morning turned to afternoon and the clock ticked down to four o'clock to reports from both Microsoft and Google. Now, let me be clear. It's Microsoft and Google that reported, right? Microsoft, they beat on every line. They came in at 269 a share versus 256, right? There's no surprise there. Revenues of 56.19 billion, up 8.3%. Intelligent cloud revenue, 23.9 billion versus 23.8. Uh, personal computing revenue, 13.9 billion versus the estimate of 13.58. Yet, they sold the stock off after the report because the cloud business, their Azure business, grew slightly slower year over year, 27% versus the 31%. And the and Nadella projects that it's going to continue to slow in the current quarter as they look to boost spending to expand services, right? I think that's bullish. They took the stock down 4% in the after-hours market, the trader types. But remember, the stock is up 46% year to date. I say let them sell it because it just means better prices for the long-term investor. It's Microsoft. I mean, come on, think about this. Google, on the other hand, also reported beats on every line you can imagine. Everywhere you looked, you know, Google beat, 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 beat. The stock is up 6.5% in the after-hours market, right? Better ad trends, better revenues, lots of capital spending to drive AI. CFO Ruthie Porter is to become president and CIO in September. Google's now up 38% year to date. I just can't wait to hear today, I'm sure we're going to hear it, how many times both CEOs mentioned AI in their presentations, because that is directly tied to whether they, how far they take the stock up or down. Uh, apparently, Google said, Google said it more, whatever. Neither one of those reports is going to make me change my mind on the investment thesis as a long-term investor. Sure, as a day trader, yeah, whip it around, do what you want. 
I'd be buying more Microsoft on weakness. I'd be sitting pretty with my Google as they, as they take it higher. We're now on the verge of a host of tech earnings. So this is when the rubber hits the road for NASDAQ. Can it maintain its advance or will we see it come under some pressure in the weeks ahead? Look, the NASDAQ index is up 35% year to date. Expectations are high. The market is priced to perfection, leaving little to no room forever, Gabish. Any big misses or weaker guidance is gonna be the perfect excuse for a broader pullback. Now, while it's possible, I don't see it right now. My guess is that it's gonna be an economic issue that is the catalyst for a broader market retreat. Now, today's Fed Day, right? JJ's due to announce in less than seven hours. And while no one expects any surprises, they're all curious about what's next for the Fed forward commentary. 40% of the street is looking for this to be the last hike. 40% um, are expecting another hike before November, and 20% are, are betting on a September rate hike, right? A 25 basis point rate hike today brings us to five and a quarter, five and a half percent, slightly below what some members of the Fed have been suggesting. I'm in the five and a half to 575 camp. I'm really in the 6% camp, but I don't see that happening right now unless inflation really kicks up again. I want to see them raise the terminal rate enough to kill inflation, leaving no doubt uh, that they've achieved their goals, right? And five and a quarter, five and a half just doesn't do it for me. But that's what makes the market, right? Both buyers and sellers. In fact, Nikki T, right? Nikki Timros, uh, the Fed mouthpiece at the Wall Street Journal, uh, 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 writes about what JJ's concerned about, right? On the 24th of July, he penned a piece titled Why the Fed Isn't Ready to Declare Victory on Inflation, suggesting further rate hikes. And this morning, his piece continues to call into question the Fed's next move, right? The title is Fed to Raise Rates to a 22-Year High. Here's what to focus on. And then he goes on to say economic growth has likely been too strong for central bank officials to validate investor expectations that this will be the last hike. Suggesting once again, there's more hikes to come. And there it is. The Fed leaks this commentary to Nikki. He writes about it in the Wall Street Journal. And then the Fed can go back and say, geez, why is everyone surprised? Nikki laid this out in his piece on July 26th. It's all very choreographed. Remember that. Eco data today includes mortgage apps and new home sales. And the expectation is for a decline of 5% in new home sales, which I think is total nonsense, right? Remember, home builders have all kinds of ways of attracting new home buyers. We've seen these surprises over the last uh, five months. Last month, the expectation was for a decline of 1%, and we got a gain of 12%. That's an 11%. That's a, actually a 13% swing, right? And while I do not expect the same excitement this month, I do expect it uh, to be in positive territory, not negative territory. This morning, U.S. futures are lower. Dow futures down 80. The SP is down 5. The Nasdaq's down 27. The Russell's, uh, the Russell's actually up 4. Earnings include Coke. They already beat. Hilton Hotels, Thermo, uh, TMO, American Tele phone ADP along with 20 plus more names. After the bell, we're going to hear from Meta. We're going to hear from Chipotle. We're going to hear from Mattel and a few more. Treasuries this morning are steady, still holding the line. The two years yielding 4.86%, the 10 years yielding 3.89%. 30 year mortgage rates are better than 7% and likely to go higher after today's uh, move. And the shorter duration bills are still yielding better than 5.4%. Oil continues to trade higher in the 78 uh, $80 range. Yesterday, we saw a trade as high as $79.80. The story remains the same. Chinese government stimulus to help boost their economy is only going to increase demand for energy out of China. It's the same story. It's not any different. Uh, so we remain in the $75.80, $81 trading range. Uh, for WTI. The dollar index is trading at 101.14. That's, you know, that's right in line where it's been. It remains below all three trend lines. Gold continues to trade right here in the low 2000s, trading at 2010 this morning. We're now between the intermediate and short-term trend lines of 2001 and 2022. I suspect we're going to remain there unless the dollar moves significantly one way or the other. The rate rise today will not be a surprise because uh, the market already knows this. What could be a surprise is JJ makes it emphatically clear that rates are going up again at the next meeting. That would suggest that he remains concerned about the underlying inflationary pressures that remain sticky. 
uh, which would push the dollar higher, right? And then put pressure on commodities, leaving the door open, but not committing suggests that he's not sure about sticky inflation, allowing the dollar just to sit tight and commodities to kind of remain steady. European stocks are lower this morning. It's all about earnings and there's a global central bank policy. Remember, it's the Fed today, it's the ECB tomorrow, it's the Bank of Japan on Friday. The S&P ended the day at 45.67, up 12 points. But this morning, the markets feel just a bit tired, like I've been saying. Traders and investors remain cautious ahead of today's Fed announcement and then the press conference after. And while we all expect a 25 basis point hike, the focus is clearly going to be on what JJ says about the data and the coming September meeting. We're, uh, we're in this tighter range, 4,400, 4,600, but the trend line support is at 4,330, right? Like I've been telling you, I'm patient. I'm going to be patient with any new money. I want to wait and see what happens today and how investors react. I want, I want to see a pullback that shakes the branches a bit, causing some of the weaker uh, hands to, you know, to let go uh, and see prices retreat a little bit. Okay, so now what are we having for dinner? So this is this great dish, you can make it. It's a great family style platter, right? You want roasted chicken parts, so legs and thighs. Uh, you can use breast too, but legs and thighs are, 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 are dark meat and they're sweeter and more delicious. Sweet sausage and sweet vinegar peppers. Now, you need the thighs and the legs. You need bone in and skin on. You need salt and pepper, olive oil, sweet Italian sausage. You need vinegar peppers, garlic, white wine, chicken broth, marinated artichoke hearts, thin sliced potatoes, salt and pepper. Um, and you need total time about one hour start to finish, right? Maybe a little bit longer. You want to preheat your oven to 40 degrees, preheat the grill for cooking the sausages. Now season the chicken pieces with salt and pepper. Heat up the oil in a frying pan. When it's nice and hot, reduce the heat to medium high, and then add the chicken pieces and brown them on all sides. 10 minutes total, you want to get them a little bit nice and crusty, right, brown. While this is cooking, place the sliced potatoes, the potatoes, thin sliced potatoes, just cut them thin, into a baking dish. Season those with salt and pepper, add a splash of olive oil. You could even add melted butter. Remove the chicken from the frying pan and place it in the baking dish with the potatoes, and then put it in the oven and continue to cook it for about 30 minutes uncovered. Next, cook the sausage on the grill. Careful not to burn them, maybe 10 minutes or so. You just want to get them all nice and charred, right? Remove them from the grill, let them rest for three or four minutes, and then cut them into just bite-sized pieces, right? In the meantime, you're going to go back to the frying pan that still has the, the chicken fat in it. You're going to add the, uh, the garlic along with the sliced vinegar peppers. You want to saute it around just to heat them up. Now add the sausage, put in a uh, half a cup of white wine, uh, and then add the chicken broth, let it come to a boil and let it reduce. Now add the chicken heart, saute that for another five minutes or so. Now remove the chicken. After about a half an hour, remove the chicken from the oven using the tongs, place the chicken pieces in the saute pan with the sausages and the artichokes. Turn the oven from baking to broil and then put the potatoes back in to crisp them up a bit, right? Now, when you're ready, you're going to uh, take the potatoes out of the oven. You're going to serve this on a large, warmed platter family style. Put the chicken all in the middle with the potatoes all around it. Accompany this with a large mixed salad dressed in kind of a balsamic vinaigrette or your favorite dressing. You know me, I always like just salt, and pepper, oregano, and fresh lemon juice. I find that to be clean and easy and really good. Uh, and you want to enjoy this with your with your favorite chilled white wine. And you can use the white wine that you use in the in the dish. And you know me, don't ask. It's Pinot Grigio, Santa Margarita. That's always my go-to wine, both for cooking and for drinking. In any event, look at this day, and I can tell you it is just beautiful here. In any event, until tomorrow, take good care.